The challenges facing the global food system in the coming decades are well documented. Even by 2030, there is a need not only to feed an increasing world population, but one which is increasingly urbanized with 60% of the world's population in cities, resulting in associated dietary and lifestyle changes. Such changes by 2030 are estimated to require 50% more available food, but not necessarily 50% more production, as reduced food losses and reduced wastage can also contribute to future food availability. It's also estimated that we shall need 50% more energy and 30% more fresh water to meet global needs by 2030. This morning, we are here to discuss and debate issues impacting on this dynamic and turbulent environment involving our food system. It's not surprising that the business environment in the food industry today has been described by one of the top food and beverage companies as turbulent, challenging, unpredictable, and dynamic. And of course, at the center of this debate are consumer attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions and behaviors. Digital communications have allowed consumers to seek and share information easily. They want to know more about their food beyond whether it is safe and authentic. Consumers now want to know what their food was made from, the origin of the ingredients, how they have been produced, its nutritional content and value, and the extent of processing. In addition, different age groups have different needs and wants in terms of their lifestyles and nutritional requirements. This session promises to provide unique insights into these issues and the challenges of modern food businesses. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our panel today, Ron Insana, a highly respected business journalist and money manager. For more than two decades, he has been a contributor to CNBC and MSNBC, as well as a contributing author to Money Magazine and USA Today. Would you all please join me in welcoming Ron Insana? Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, everyone. Um, just a quick market note before we jump into our topic. Uh, Greece pulled out of its deal with the EU just a little while ago. The Dow is down about 450 points in early trading, so looks like it's going to be a rough day. Um, that's not true. I'm just making sure you're awake. Um, <laughs> market's fine. Everything's good. Um. <laughs> <Ellie. laughs> Trust me, that's the first time in my career anybody ever applauded about the market being down and then not being down. Uh, we, we do, as, as, as Colin indicated, have a very vibrant conversation to get started with, and we should do that uh, in, in, in short order. So let me uh, uh, bring up our, our panel of uh, distinguished uh, uh, guests this morning. Uh, David Cotton is the CEO of Flying Food Group, an airline industry veteran. He was vice president of aviation and head of First National Bank of Chicago. Prior to that, he was a management consultant. David has an MBA from the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business and a BA in economics from Yale University. He's recently given a generous contribution to Girls Inc. For the third year in a row at this annual event, we are hosting students from Girls Inc. of Orange County, California, and Central Alabama. Now, these students are exper thank you. These students are experiencing firsthand what we do here. They're meeting food scientists, going on field trips, and learning about the business of food science at the Food Expo. Jim Burrell is Executive Vice President of DuPont Pioneer. Jim joined DuPont in 1978 as a sales representative. He served as management roles in Canada and Japan for the company. He was named to his current position in October of 2009, assumed responsibility for the sustainability function and the Latin America region in 2014. Jim serves on the Board of Trustees of the National 4-H Council, the Board of Directors for CropLife International, the Board of Trustees at the Farm Foundation, the Board of Trustees at the University of Delaware, and the Board of Directors at the Grocery Manufacturers Association. He graduated from Iowa State University with a degree in agricultural business. 
And Eric Larson is the chairman, managing partner, and co-founder of Linden Capital Partners. He's been involved in principal investing since 1985. Eric is, uh, has been on a board member of over a dozen public and private companies. He's a member of the Leadership Council for the Harvard School of Public Health, the Illinois Institute of Technology, Board of Trustees, and the Commercial Club of Chicago. He also has affiliations with several science-related institutions. Eric holds a degree in biology from Harvard College and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. So please, I'll welcome everyone. And just as a logistical note, as we move through the morning, if you have questions to ask our panel, please, please submit those questions online by text. You can go to pollev.com or you can text IFT15 and your question to 22. 333, 22333. So again, welcome, gentlemen. Appreciate your joining us this morning. And um, Jim, I'm going to start with you. So this morning I had my Pop-Tarts. I had uh, some Cheerios with hormone-treated milk. I had my um, coffee with a non-dairy creamer and Splenda. How much longer do I have to live? <laughs> You'll have a long and prosperous life. <laughs> so let, let, let's address this, though, these, these, the documentaries and, and, and a variety of different um, uh, published materials we have seen of late that basically says, as, as, as the title of our conversation uh, suggests today, big food is bad food. Mm -hmm. the, the, what we're eating now, uh, processed foods, uh, genetically modified uh, foods, are inherently bad for us in some way, as yet unidentified. How do you deal with that argument as a, as a scientist and someone who actually is a practitioner in the business? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's important for all of us in the food industry to be willing to listen to people who have uh, whatever point of view they have, try to see uh, if there is some, uh, uh, something in there that's common ground, something that we need to pay attention to and be willing to adapt. So that's, that's clearly one thing. We need to be willing and able to engage. Um, but we also need to, to continue to advance uh, science and stand behind sound science-based regulations and um, um, organized, consistent labeling so that people have the information that can give them the assurance they need. And so uh, clearly there are uh, um, lots of debates today about food, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. People are interested in where their food comes from. Um, so I think we ought to welcome the discussion, engage in the dialogue, but at the same time, help educate people and help them understand the, uh, the underpinnings that have really enabled us to have one of the safest and most affordable food supplies in the world. Now, now David, you know, it's funny, a couple, uh, about two months ago, my, my wife wanted me to go on something that was like kind of a quasi-paleo diet. And, and, and the rule here was not to eat anything with ingredients, which I always find interesting. Um, because <laughs> the, the, the proponents of this say is that if it, if it has an ingredient on the label, you shouldn't eat it. Um, there, the, these diet cycles, these various you know, uh, nutrition cycles that we go through in, in popular terms, throw out these ideas rather rapidly, you know, whether they're valid or not. And so if you go into a place that sells some of your you know, lunch foods, uh, they're packaged, they have ingredients, um, and some people are telling me I shouldn't eat them. So how, how do you deal with this kind of pop culture issue that crops up on a regular basis? Well, we're in the uh, business of uh, providing products to end users, to other customers. So uh, from my perspective, uh, the burden of that uh, falls more on, um, on our customers than it does on us, because we're the uh, manufacturer and assembler of various food products uh, that is then sold in the, in the retail segment. But what we have done, we worked very hard on establishing partnerships uh, with the companies that we provide products to, so that whatever they put on that label, we know that's what's in the food. It's very important to us um, because uh, their name goes on that, their reputation goes on that, and we spend a lot of time and resources making sure that we have the right science that goes into that so that whatever it says on those ingredients, that is what is in there. And also, uh, our company is involved primarily uh, if not exclusively, into really the fresh food business. Uh, so um, uh, except for things that may be selected by our customers, uh, we will not have as much of, uh, of, of if you would, processed ingredients uh, as uh, the uh, prepackaged meals that you may buy that have what we call a longer shelf life, because we're really in the, in the fresh food segment. 
So, so Eric, as, as you, you know, review businesses that, that, that are potentially, you know, interesting to you, uh, what, in this ongoing national debate, I mean, where do you fall when you're looking at the opportunity sets that exist and, you know, whether it's, it's a company that provides new technology, uh, new systems, new uh, ways of processing or delivering, you know, food, uh, does the consumer debate enter into your investing process in any way, shape, or form? Uh, very much so. Yeah. Uh, th th I think the consumer's role today is more, it's probably always been important, but in the businesses that we're involved with, we are very interested in how they are driving trends uh, in, in uh, demand these days. Uh, particularly this group of um, millennials who are skeptical about everything, um, they, they are helping to create new um, products that are, that are and, and they sample things from all around the world, so uh, it, it makes for a much more diverse kind of food system than what perhaps we've had before.